Greetings, I'm Eddie Hyatt. I want to welcome you to another telecast of Revive America. So glad that you've joined me today. And our theme today is about how the great awakening out of which America was formed, how this great awakening of 1726 to 1760 that we've talked about in past broadcasts, wherein entire cities and towns of colonial America repented and turned to God. I want to talk today about how this great awakening lifted marginalized groups in American colonial society at the time. And uh, these groups included women, American Indians, African Americans. You know, the word margins, I'm using the word mar marginalized groups. And of course, a margin is something that is out on the edge, out on the periphery. And um, any kind of society has its marginalized groups. Those who are not like us that we tend to keep at a distance. There is a, a great example of this in John chapter 4, uh, where Jesus, it says, John 4, 4, that Jesus needed to go through Samaria. Now, interestingly, normally Jews didn't go through Samaria. The Jews who lived in Galilee, which was the northern part of Israel, to get to Judea, Samaria was in between, but they did, the Jews didn't like Samaritans. They were not uh, pure Jews. They were a mixed breed of people. And, uh, uh, and so Jews looked down their nose at them and would have nothing to do with them and would skirt and go around their territory so as to avoid having to have any kind of interaction with them. But Jesus made a point to go through Samaria. And that's where you all, most of you know the story, how he stopped at Jacob's well and while the disciples went into a town to get something to eat, he talked to a Samaritan woman. She was a marginalized individual. She was somebody that was kept at a distance, especially by Jewish men. For when his disciples came back, the scripture says in John 4 that they were amazed that he would talk to a Samaritan woman. And yet Jesus talked to her. And she, she was the first person to whom he revealed himself as the Messiah. Those that society had pushed out to the edge and had marginalized, Jesus drew in and pulled in to himself. Hallelujah. And as a result of that, the entire city came out to hear Jesus. And I have no doubt in my mind that this Samaritan woman and Jesus being willing and going out of his way to talk to her was the reason for the great revival in Samaria that we read about in Acts chapter 8 where Philip went down to Samaria. And this is when Jesus also made this very powerful statement that's relative to you and I in this lesson today. When he said, lift up your eyes. Don't say there are yet four months and then comes the harvest. Lift up your eyes and look. For the fields are already white unto harvest. Why hadn't they seen it? Because they had been avoiding the harvest. <laughs> These were people they didn't want to have anything to do with. These were people that were different from them. And yet they were people who were ripe for harvest. I wonder if there are people in our lives today, in our world today, in our society today that we have marginalized because they're different from us and yet they're ripe for harvest. Something to think about. The Great Awakening lifted the marginalized of colonial America. Just before we get into that lesson, I want to tell you about three books that I draw from from these lessons. These are books that I have written that every person should read. The first one that you see there on the screen is called America's Revival Heritage. And the bulk of these lessons are being drawn from this book that I wrote several years ago. It's been in print now uh, about two years, so it's, it's fairly new. Have no question that the Holy Spirit initiated the writing of this book and directed me in the writing and publishing of it. And, and provided the funds in a very remarkable way for the publishing of this book. Maybe I'll tell about that in one of these telecasts. 
But then the second book you see there is my most recent book called Pursuing Power. Wow, what an important book. It's getting a lot of attention right now. And, uh, and then the third book is Revival Fire with a subtitle of How to Discern Between the True and the False. And boy, is this such an important theme in our world today, especially among Pentecostals and Charismatics, where many are chasing signs without any discernment. And this book will show you how to discern between the true and the false when it comes to revival and spiritual awakenings. So I hope you will uh, get a copy of those. They're available on my website, www.eddiehyatt.com. And also they're available from Amazon, both in hard copy and in the Kindle format. Well, as I mentioned earlier, our theme today is the Great Awakening lifted the marginalized of colonial American society. And we're going to mention three different groups. The American Indians, we call them today Native Americans, uh, women, and African Americans, black folks in colonial American society. Now, we know, we learned from last lessons that entire towns and even cities like Philadelphia were being transformed by this great awakening. But I want to tell you, first of all, let's talk about the Native Americans. You see, there had been some tensions and even some wars that had broken out between the colonists and Native Americans. And um, the first separatist Puritans that came to America developed very good relationships with the Native people here. In fact, the very first Thanksgiving of those first settlers there in uh, Plymouth, Massachusetts, uh, they invited some of the Native Americans of that area, one particular tribe, to come and join in with them, and they did. And the Native Americans brought food, they brought deer that they had dressed, and uh, the, the pilgrims there, they provided stuff from their gardens and that they had grown. And it was supposed to be for one day, and they had a lot of games and food and contest and running contests and different things and shooting contests. And they all had so much fun that they extended it for three days. <laughs> and so it was a very blessed time. But as second generation and third generation Puritans came on the scene and more moved in from England, there came more of a desire for affluence and possessions and power and for land. And there were some uh, unethical dealings with some of the Native Americans in acquiring uh, land and possessions from them. And of course, at the same time, the Native Americans, they were suspicious of their newcomers and, uh, and of this new religion they were sharing with them. And it caused a lot of mistrust. In fact, many of the chiefs and medicine men, uh, they saw these settlers and their preaching of a new religion as a threat to their own power. And so there had developed a lot of tensions and actually some, some battles and some wars had broke out creating extra tensions. But during the Great Awakening, where there was this emphasis, and in the Great Awakening, here are some of the emphases that led to the lifting of the marginalized. There was this emphasis that all people are under the power of sin, no matter what their social status is, the high, the low, they are all separated from God by sin and in need of a Savior. And so it didn't matter if you were a Native American or if you were a, one of the leaders among the Puritans or the settlers. It didn't matter if you were slave or free. It didn't matter if you were a man or a woman. Everybody was on the same level when it came to their need before God because they believed and preached, as Paul said, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And in the blazing light of God's holiness and God's justice, all were in need of a Savior. And there was only one way that any could come. No one could rely on their social status. None could rely on their wealth. 
None could rely on their ethnicity or their race. All had to come by the same route through the cross of Jesus Christ, and the ground was level at the cross. This was the, the belief of the preachers of the Great Awakening. This is the message that they preached. And so out of necessity, they found it necessary to reach out to those whom the colonial American society had marginalized because of these beliefs that all people are in the same predicament, separated from God by their sins. And there's only one way that they can be saved, and that is through the cross of Jesus Christ. And so there were some people of the Great Awakening out of the stirring of the Holy Spirit and out of this realization that everyone is in need of the good news of Jesus Christ, they stepped out of their cultural comforts and they went out and they began to preach to the Native Americans. One of these was a young man by the name of David Brainerd. David Brainerd had attended Yale College University now. He had also been ordained, I believe it was by the Presbyterians if I'm not mistaken, and uh, he had encountered this, the Great Awakening while he was at Yale College. And his heart was stirred. And God obviously put in his heart a real concern and compassion for some of the people that were in the society were marginalized and were being left out. And so he took initiative and he went out into the wilderness, rode his horse out into the wilderness having only the weapons of prayer and a stirring in his heart to reach these people that did not know the true and living God through Jesus Christ. Out there in the wilderness, he suffered great personal deprivation. But he persevered and he prayed. Somewhere along the way, he was able to make friends with a Native American who became his interpreter. And eventually this interpreter came to know God through Jesus Christ and came to know David Brainerd. And, and uh, over after two or three years, David Brainerd shared how that this interpreter seemed to experience the same passion and the same empowering of the Spirit that he did in the preaching, that he would express the message that David Brainerd was preaching in English. He could sense that this uh, interpreter was expressing it with the same passion and the same uh, intonations that he was expressing in English. But David Brainerd set himself to prayer. I want to read just a little quote. This is from my book, America's Revival Heritage. Oh, if you're concerned about this nation like I am, you need to read this book. This book will give you information it will give you knowledge that you need. And you know, there's a scripture in the Old Testament that says, God said, my people perish for lack of knowledge. Folks, knowledge is power. And this book will give you knowledge to counter a lot of things that are going on in our nation today. But in David Brainerd's journal, he kept a daily journal. And on April 19th, 1742, he's out in the wilderness and he says, I set apart this day for fasting and prayer to God for His grace, especially to prepare me for the work of the ministry. Oh, and I'm laughing because of some of the crazy things that are being taught about grace today. Here's how David Brainerd saw grace. He said, I set apart this day for fasting and prayer to God for His grace. In other words, that out of His goodness and grace, that to prepare me for the work of the ministry. He didn't see grace as a license for him to just go out and indulge himself in a selfish lifestyle. No, he saw God's grace empowering him, even though he didn't deserve it, but empowering him to fulfill this mission to the American Indians. And so he says, brings up a weeping inside of me. He says, I set apart this day for fasting and prayer to God for His grace. 
especially to prepare me for the work of the ministry, to give me divine aid and direction in my preparations for that great work. And in his own time to send me into his harvest. He said, in the forenoon, I felt the power of intercession for precious immortal souls, for the advancement of the kingdom of my dear Savior, of my dear Lord and Savior in the world. Now I'll just go on and read this. Very moving. He says, God enabled me so to agonize in prayer that I was quite wet with sweat, though in the shade and the cool wind. He says, my soul was drawn out very much for the world. I like that. <laughs> Not just for his ministry there in New England to the Native Americans, but he said, my soul was drawn out for the world. Maybe he prayed for us today. Maybe he prayed for America in this hour. Maybe he prayed for some of you in other countries who are watching this. He says, my soul was drawn out very much for the world. Oh, that a spirit of prayer and intercession would come upon some people who are watching me right now and that your soul would be stirred by the Holy Spirit and would be drawn out in intercessory prayer for the world. He says, I grasped for multitudes of souls. He felt he felt his heart and his soul, the way he described it, grasping in prayer for multitudes of souls. Folks, it's that kind of prayer. You see, it's a prayer. Uh, it, it's, it's not a little simple lay me down to sleep prayer, but it's out of a life that is consecrated and given to God. And then God comes and even God by his spirit begins to pray his own prayers through us. And this is what is happening with David Brainerd. He's given himself up completely to God. And now even in his times of prayer, God by his spirit is praying his prayers through David Brainerd. Oh, I hope that someone's watching me today. You will allow God to intercede through you and make intercession through you. Uh, for this nation or for the nation wherever you may be watching in Ireland, England, Nepal, India, that you'll allow God to make intercession through you. David Brainerd suffered want. He suffered, he, 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 he had to live for quite some time before he built his own lodging. He suffered deprivation and hardship which, which actually took a toll on his health which I'll share more about later. But eventually he did see the answer to his prayers and his intercessions. It began in 1745. He wrote on August the 8th, 1745, a little over two years after he recorded that particular time of prayer that I read. And there's other times of prayers that he records. That wasn't a one-time thing. But there in a place called Cross cross swinging let me pronounce it i have it here in my book cross weeksun new jersey he was ministering to the tribe of the delaware native americans and all of a sudden something happened it was something out of heaven it was not something that david brainerd worked up david brainerd listen he did not have a praise band to stir things up with some good music Nothing wrong with good music. I love music. I'm a musician. I love music. I love worshiping God. But sometimes today I'm afraid in so much of what is called revival, we rely on good music and good musicians and good singers just to stir things up and to entertain people and, and to entertain their emotions. David Brainerd had no praise band. He had no worship team. He had nothing in the natural to try to stir things up and to stir people's emotions. All he had was his faith in God and his prayers that God would intervene from heaven. Reminds me of the passage that we're going to talk about sometime along the way in these teachings. 2 Chronicles 7, 14, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then while I will hear from heaven and so on. 
But suddenly, August the 8th, 1745, here's what he wrote in his journal. And there was a place there where he was gathered. He'd invited the Native Americans to come together. And suddenly, it was like on the day of Pentecost. He says, the power of God seemed to descend upon the assembly like a mighty rushing wind. I think he was hearkening back to that day of Pentecost and what happened. He said, and with an astonishing energy bore down all before it. He said, they were almost universally praying and crying for mercy in every part of the house. What you have to realize is before this, they have been very uninterested in David Brainerd and what he has to say. Very indifferent. And he says, they were almost universally praying and crying for mercy in every part of the house and many out of doors and numbers could neither go nor stand. Wow. Their concern was so great, each one for himself, that none seemed to take any notice of those about them. But each prayed freely for himself. I thought this had a near resemblance to the day of God's power mentioned in Joshua 10, 14. For I must say I never saw any day like it. Well, there's much more that is an edited version that I pulled out of his journal. And I noticed in reading his journal that this was a beginning because after this, time after time, he talks about how that the presence of God seems to be so real in the gatherings and, and how Native Americans begin to gather even from other tribes. And he had built himself a little lodge in which to live and now he talked about how they begin to come and they begin to build around him until eventually 20 families had built because they wanted to be, they just felt drawn to him and what was happening and 20 Families built lodges all around his until there was this little community built around him. And then after this in his journal, he talks about so much about how that the presence of God is so real and powerful and people weeping. These are the Native Americans, the American Indians weeping before God and, and, and how they, they're, they're, they're just caught up with Jesus and so in love with him. And in my book, I tell about, and this was... Later, he talks about, this is how he described the particular assembly there. And then there were other assemblies, congregations that gathered and were formed. And he wrote of his beloved assembly of American Indians. He says, I know of no assembly of Christians. This is on page 45 of the book, America's Revival Heritage. He says, I know of no assembly of Christians where there seems to be so much of the presence of God, where brotherly love so much prevails, and where I could take so much delight in the public worship of God in general as in my own congregation. David Brainerd, I, we don't know for sure what brought it on. I know that he suffered a lot of lack and deprivation there in seeking to carry out his work among the American Indians. And in his journal, he tells about experiencing sickness and sometimes he would have to just not do anything for several days and he talks at different times about coughing up blood and so on. But yet he persevered and he continued. He eventually came to the place where he could not continue. And he finally uh, wound up in the home of Jonathan Edwards, the great preacher, theologian, and pastor of the Great Awakening that we've talked about in past lessons. And uh, it was there that he spent his final days. And uh, Jonathan Edwards' uh, daughter, one of his daughters, became his primary caretaker. And, and he finally expired and died of tuberculosis. But even his final days and his final hours, he, he still, as long as he can, he's writing his journal. He is concerned about the work of God among the Native Americans and, and for the entire church of God. And one thing that impressed me, even in his final days, and he knows that he's going to die, 
he's praying for a great outpouring of God's Holy Spirit upon his church in America, among the American Indians. This is before America was ever formed, my friends, because I'm just going to look at his dates. Um, he died in 1747 at the age of 29. Jonathan Edwards, because Brainerd was in his home and as long as he could write, he was writing down his thoughts and his prayers in his journal every day. And so Jonathan Edwards po uh, published his journal and it had a powerful impact upon that generation. It found its way to England. John, John Wesley read it and was so stirred that he had it reprinted and distributed in his Methodist societies. And he instructed his Methodist preachers. He said, read carefully over the life of David Brainerd. Wow. Now, in our generation, a generation that has grown up on sound bites and microwave ovens, and we want everything in tidbits, it might be a, a challenge for you to read David Brainerd's journal. But if you're willing to take the time, I dare say your life will be changed and transformed like many were after his death in his generation. There are some who have taken his journal and realizing that modern people maybe have trouble wading through it and they have condensed it. In fact, my wife Susan was it, Susan, just before we married or right after we married, you bought me uh, a little condensed version of, Jonathan, of David Brainerd's journal. It's called 40 Days with David Brainerd. And this person, this editor, took little excerpts from his journal over a 40-day period. Very powerful little, uh, little book. And so David Brainerd passed away, age of 29, but... The legacy and the example he left is still impacting the church and the world today. And I'm going to have to pause there. We didn't get to all that we were going to in this lesson. We'll, we'll get them next, uh, in the next lesson. But folks, it's time to pray. It's time to pray for America. It's time to pray for our families. And I'm, I'm talking to people, you have unsaved loved ones. I want to encourage you, let the Spirit of God come upon you and, and, and make intercession through you. As it says in Romans chapter 8, verses 26 and 27, that the Holy Spirit makes intercession through us according to the will of God. I could give you some examples about that, but I'll have to do it in another session. I'm going to pray with you right now, everyone that's listening. I'm going to pray with you right now. I'm going to pray that God will visit us with a spirit of prayer. God will visit you and I with a spirit of prayer that we will pray His heart, that we'll pray His desires, that we will make intercession by the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you for examples like David Brainerd that have gone before us. And I pray for my brothers and my sisters that are watching this telecast right now or maybe watching the archive versions on the website or YouTube. Lord, I ask you to come upon them right now as they look to you. Lord, come upon your people. Come upon your people, Lord, with a, a new prayer awakening, I pray, in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, we give ourselves to you. We offer ourselves to you. To you make intercession through us. Lord, I pray for families. I sense some, some folks out there, you're concerned about sons and daughters and family members. In the name of Jesus Christ, be free, be healed, be saved in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. God bless you. I look forward to seeing you on the next telecast of Revive America. I'm Eddie Hyatt. Be in touch.